Hello and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to be looking at Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law is the law that describes the force between two charged particles. In the same way that Newton's law of gravitation describes the force between two masses, we can do the same thing for electric fields. Like I say, there's loads of um, relations between the two. So let's start by just writing down what Coulomb's law is. So Coulomb's law, uh, the force between two particles is just uh, F is one over four pi epsilon naught times Q1, Q2 over R squared. Now this, when you originally uh, see it for the first time seems like a pretty complicated uh, formula. But actually this four pi epsilon naught is um, just a constant. This one over four pi epsilon naught is constant. I could just as easily have written it as f is equal to q k times q1 uh, q2 over r squared. And this looks identical to f equals g m m over r squared, right? So this is where I'm saying that there are many similarities between them because it's just the product of their masses or charges divided by the square distance between them based on some constant. Now, we've introduced a new value here, which is epsilon naught. So uh, this epsilon naught is known as the permittivity of free space. Permittivity. Permittivity. Okay, of free space. Now, most people will just tell you this is a constant, um, which is true, um, but they don't really explain what permittivity means. And actually, this is kind of just a measure of how well a substance can hold a charge. So how well a substance can hold a charge. It actually does mean a lot more than this, but this is the, I think, the simplest way to think about it. So if we're looking at the permittivity of free space, we're saying if we were just taking uh, open space like a vacuum, or air is a, a close to a vacuum, how well can that thing actually hold uh, charge? How good is air at holding charge? And we find out that epsilon naught from the formula sheet is 8. 0.85 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, farads per meter. Now we haven't introduced this unit of farads yet, so don't worry. Uh, we will come across it by the end of um, fields, uh, gravitation or electric fields. Uh, we'll see this unit of farads. So this is uh, farads. And it's basically a measure of capacitance. So capacitance is how much uh, uh, charge we can store um, between a pair of parallel plates per one volt. But we'll look at that when we get to uh, capacitance. For now, we need to be able to write this um, force equation in words. So we say that the force is directly proportional directly proportional to the product of the two charges and inversely proportional to the square distance between them. Square distance between them. Okay, so you'll notice um, this is very similar to Newton's law of gravitation. We have a direct proportionality to the product of the charges uh, and inversely proportional to the square distance between them. Our proportionality constant is just 1 over 4 pi uh, epsilon naught. Now, a key thing from um, this equation then is if we have these charges, it's possible that these charges can be both positive and negative, or positive or negative, right? So how do we then know if a force is positive or negative? Is it between attractive forces or is it between repulsive forces? 
So the way we can think about that is let's take an example. Let's say that I have um, two forces or two charges um, that are both positively charged. So I have a positive charge here and I have a positive charge here where the distance between them is just r. Okay, And I want to know the force. Well, f is going to be equal. Let's say they both have a force of q. This is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which is a constant, times q times q, so q squared, divided by r squared. Now, this is a positive force. So when I have like charges, even if this was negative q and negative q, a negative multiplied by a negative is going to give me a positive. So this means that positive forces are due to like charges. And we know that if we had two positive charges next to each other, they're going to repel, right? So it means positive forces are repulsive. Okay, so if you have uh, two negatively charged particles or two positively charged particles and you put them in the same vicinity of each other, they will always repel. And because of this formula, that means that positive forces are repulsive. And just to prove it, if I have then a positive Q and a negative Q with a distance of R between them, then F is going to be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times positive Q times minus Q over R squared. So I end up with this negative. So the uh, negative forces And this just gives you a, a little bit of an insight into um, if you have a positive force acting on something, it must mean that it has the same charge as um, the thing that it's being uh, repelled by. Now, the questions that come up most of the time will not worry about if you have a positive or negative force. Most of the time, you will just focus on the magnitude. So sometimes you will be asked to show which direction it's going to go in. Um, but for the most part, you will then s just be asked for the magnitude of the force between them. Uh, whether it's repulsive or attractive, um, you kind of be able to figure out from like key stage two knowledge. So I don't think they're, they're going to examine you too hardly uh, on that. But it is uh, good to just be aware of this, that positive forces are repulsive forces and negative forces are attractive forces. There is um, something missing from the A-level spec, however. So this is a general convention for all forces. If I have a positive force, it means I'm looking at repulsion between two things. If I have a negative force, it means I'm looking at attraction between two things. This does mean that technically all gravitational forces should be negative. This is why whenever they ask you for the um, force due to gravity, they always ask for the magnitude of the force. And that's just because um, they're neglecting the fact that it's always going to be negative. So they've just changed the the, um, the direction. So they've just changed the axis so that it can be forced to be uh, positive. And we can also use this um, representation to prove in the same way for gravitational fields um, that electric uh, fields are also infinite. They have infinite range. So we do that by saying that um, when uh, R tends to uh, infinity. This is when, uh, or actually, let's write this another way. Let's say that F is only zero newtons when R is infinity. That's because if we're saying that F is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q1 Q2 over R squared, if we're dividing by anything to get to zero, we have to divide by infinity. Therefore, we can say that electric fields have infinite range. Have infinite range. And we can plot this the same way we did uh, before. Now, um, we plotted this graph of uh, force against distance. And we said that we have F and R, and we had um, this inverse proportionality. So we said that F 
is inversely proportional to r squared, which means that um, for very large values of r, I've got very small val sorry, very large values of f, I have a very small value for r. So I'll end up with um, very large values here. And the opposite is true. Um, for very large values of r, I end up with very small values of f. So I end up with this kind of relationship. Now, from what we can tell, um, the electrons and protons and things like this, uh, protons, for example, we could say that we can break down and we can go inside. And um, in that case, you will see a similar relationship to gravitational fields where you actually see a change of one uh, of F being proportional to R rather than this inverse uh, square proportionality. But if we were to take another charge, uh, like an electron, we think electrons, as far as we're aware currently, are fundamental particles not made up of anything else, which means we can't actually go inside of an electron. Um, so we can neglect the idea of what happens here, but we're expecting if we were to ever um, be able to measure the charge inside an electron, it should fall to zero. So we should end up with some point uh, where we reach the surface where it's then going to change uh, to become uh, zero when r is equal to zero, not infinite. Okay, so this kind of covers everything that we um, know about forces. Um, I'm going to do another example question in a very similar way to the way that we did um, the forces question for gravitational fields. I'll do a separate video uh, talking through a similar example for charges. Thank you for watching.